uh, Your Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to go for a few um, slides around the notion uh, of reenacting uh, science. And I'm told that I have to speak uh, for a short amount of time so that we have discussion afterwards with, with, with you. So this is just a sort of visual territory around the notion which was in the old days the domain of science and which is now the joint domain of science and politics. One of the very nice journalists today showed me one of the headlines of a controversy in the US between Rick Santorum and Obama about the fact that Obama was putting the earth above the human and that he had a phony theology according to Rick Santorum, is a, as you know, a Catholic. So it means this is a ideal introduction, much better than one I'd prepare, which is Humboldt here, the great uh, natural scientist, who is going to die, and he has written, as you know, a huge book on the cosmos, which is on his shoulder, and he's somewhat happy to go in the tomb and shift the burden of a cosmos onto death herself. So this is why this guy who is going to die is actually smiling, as you see, because he goes down into uh, the, the sepulchre and leave the cosmos on someone else, including, in this case, death. That's the prime with Obama as well, and with all of us, which is on which shoulder, which, who has big enough shoulders to hold the cosmos and the earth, which was not a question of politics before. I mean, it's a very recent question of politics which is captured actually in this very uh, odd uh, word which you might have heard. It was actually on the top of a, one of the issue of economist a few months back, which is the word Anthropocene. The Anthropocene being a definition of a new uh, entity, which is us, all of you here, not individually, but en masse. In, I mean, massively, we are the Anthropos. And according to the geologists, we weigh as much as plate tectonic. And that's why the in 19 uh, August of this year, the geologists might, it's not yet decided, name the period in which we are, the geological period, the Anthropocene, to capture the fact that we weigh physically as much as geological feature, which is quite strange, just at the time when the posthuman, we were supposed to have passed the posthuman, and suddenly the humans are back, but in a strange position, they are back as massive geological forces. And these are all sort of questions turning around the notion of catastrophe, the notion of what is going to happen now to the Earth. And I, I have to say that I was very shocked to hear Clive Hamilton in Sciences Po last year. He's a philosopher from Australia, and he was presenting these amazing uh, slides here, which is the sort of uh, free possible scenario for a world at two degrees. We have missed the 2011 uh, point, and we might lose the 2015 and the 2020, and every time we lose one of the big negotiation moments, like Copenhagen in 2009, which is again a political assembly around an, a new element of nature, in this case the climate, the effort to be made in order to keep the Earth at two degrees increases dramatically. And in this book, so that you have an idea of a, of a, of a guy, uh, is called uh, Farewell to a Species. And the species is us, of course. So this is, not, this is a rather terrifying book, especially because it ends up with the argument that the big enemy in right now is hope. As long as we have hope, we are an optimistic creature, so we cannot swallow the crisis that comes, and which is now he's saying <clears throat> in his recent publication that we are to be prepared for a world that six or eight degrees, that is already something which is already there, an event which has already uh, been done. So what do we do when we are in that sort of a situation? I mean, what, what do we do when we are faced with not the catastrophe, but the, the threat of a catastrophe, which, of course, a big controversy about the amount of a catastrophe. I mean, we, we precisely, as always, with this notion of doomsday, we are always uh, worried that this might be just a catastrophist argument and not a catastrophe. And the, 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 the whole range of sentiment and feelings is certainly not up to the task of the, uh, the size of what is expected 
uh, from us. But what is sure, and that's why the reenacting means several things in this talk. It means, of course, to redo the sciences again at a scale, which is, of course, completely different from what science was before in separate domain, in secluded laboratory inside universities. And now science and technology is as big as the social fabric itself. So there is no difference. And, of course, the scientists are very worried by that because we are in the middle of other, all sorts of disputes. And the climate gate controversy is, of course, one very good case for that. So the participation of the public is, of course, something moot. I mean, it's no longer the participation of the public. We are inside the same public experiment, but we like it or not. And that's what makes a science gallery like this one here so interesting, because it's not putting science to the public, it's bringing the public and the scientists to the same issue. So it's a very different type of organization, not without anything to do with the old idea that science has to be diffused to the public. No, now it's not the case anymore. But the problem, of course, is what, what it is to do politics with the cosmos. And the word cosmopolitics in this talk is actually, you have to hear cosmos not as cosmopolitan, although this is also a value, of course, we should cherish, but with the cosmos, politics of the cosmos. And again, when uh, Monsieur Santorum says that Monsieur Obama brings the earth above the human, he's doing cosmopolitics, he's accusing, uh, accusing Obama of the wrong definition, of the wrong center of attention for politicals. And, of course, we have absolutely no idea what democracy is. And what is a democracy in the Anthropocene time? I mean, what it is to do a democracy, or geocracy, maybe is the word, at the scale of a phenomenon which other people, like Clive Hamilton, says is happening. I mean, there's this complete disconnect between the tiny size of the po political spheres the political organization that we are used to, voting, electing, MPs, diplomats, uh, the whole tiny organization we have to handle our human affairs and the question of what it is to do with uh, the cosmos. So all of these questions are interesting and I turn them, I name them with this uh, argument of Gaia. Why is it important? Because just this is an example from a book by Paul Edwards, the climate gate skeptics, the one you call, I think, in English, deniers, or skeptics, or negationists, I mean, there are several words for that, depending, are actually also the one who do a very strange operation, which is to check in everywhere in the US the places where the data are collected to produce the models for climate change. That is, these guys who are climate skeptics are sent to measure or re-measure the data from all the different sources of information which you see here on this Google map. But in the old days, we were talking about participation of the public, <laughs> and we wanted to interest public to the science. Now, these are much too interested in science. They want to check the data, and they want to check the data themselves, and they are reorganized a whole series of climatoskeptic sites in order to see that at some point there is a small differences between the, 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 the amount of data which is produced in this or that um, uh, instrument because there is a new building and thus there is no wind or less heat or more heat, etc. and so on. Which is quite interesting because, of course, the whole science of climate, as you know, is actually based on models. It's models recalculating data. And here we have a very uh, interesting fight between two epistemologies, two conceptions of science, a very positivistic definition of what science is, and another one which is very innovative, which is the climate. Uh, the climate, the set of disciplines called climatology. climatology. But this is a very horrifying exp experience of people interested in science in a way which is very destructive of the very fabric of science. And we also have to deal with that when we begin to reenact the science. These guys are reenacting science pretty well. And you see that it's what I'm interested in is really trying to think, and maybe we can do that in the discussion around the notion of what is a representative government. I mean, what does it mean to be a representative government when the question of representation is actually cosmic elements? I mean, not only the climate, of course, but also the fish, the air, all of the classical emblem, emblems of power. And this is very important for art as well as for science and for politics because it's actually coming back to very traditional ways of looking at politics. I mean, here you will recognize Siena uh, beautiful, good government and bad government. And of course, there is nobody 
uh, in government, in politics, which is not interested in this fabulous fresco, um, which, has, which is a sort of, of symbol of some of all the things known in the, at the end of the Middle Age about what it is to represent good government on top and bad government on the bottom. It's in the Siena mayor, mayoral office. Uh, the bottom is actually less restored than the top because the bad government attracted less money probably, I don't know, but it, it, as you see, it's less restored. But what is interesting for us, looking at it now from a 21st century outlook, is that this is very much an ecological statement as well about the good government is the one which has beautiful landscape, uh, rich biodiversity, beautiful uh, um, churches and architecture, a large commerce, a vibrant uh, art, and so on and so forth, while the bad government down there is the one where the, the, the landscape is ruined, people cannot do something without being mugged and uh, assassinated. And it's as much as, as important as the symbols of the power and which have been studied by many excellent scholars, including uh, Quentin uh, Skinner. So what is interesting in this uh, atmosphere of politics, which is the title of the exhibition we did in uh, ZKM around this question, is that we are in a way talking about cosmopolitics and reinventing the feeling for what it is to be in a good government or bad government back in time in a definition of politics which predates the modernist definition of politics as dealing with humans. Here you see the, on the top the good government and the bad government. So the question I want to sort of start uh, illuminating with you is this question of shoulders. We, how can we shoulder <laughs> the cosmos? And of course, one of the great thinkers of this question is Peter Sloterdijk, which is now translated in English, the three volumes of Globe. This is actually a quote from the French. I'm sorry, I didn't correct it. Um, which is uh, a whole free volume, very important for the artist as well as design and philosophers around this question of the globe. I mean, the whole history of what it is to live in envelopes. And Peter Sloterdijk is probably the most important philosophers right now because of that, and one of the few trying to understand what it is to rethink politics with a cosmic uh, view. And the paradox, of course, that he points out is that globalization is a very strange word because when there was no globalization in the sense that we were not yet integrated economically, no banks could actually destroy a country like Ireland or Greece at the time, we were thinking of a globe. So the thinking of a globe, which is the first, second volume of this uh, free book series, a huge book, I mean, he's a German philosopher, so he writes a huge book, but very well, contrary to most German philosophers. You write excellently, and I hope it's well translated in English also. So when we had a globe, when we had no globalization, we had a globe inside which we could actually pictures and put everything into place. And now that we have globalization, we are lost. Lost in what is the third volume of this great series, which he called forms, bubbles, small little entities. So just at the time where we have to think about the big, the global, we are actually inside little foamy Bubbles. This is, of course, the big example he uses, which is Mercator. It's a beautiful uh, example in your library here in Trinity, which I saw uh, yesterday, where uh, you have actually holding, um, as you know, the atlas at the time of the globe was the, not the one holding the earth on his shoulder, but the one holding the earth scientifically in his hands. So there's a, a reversion of the metaphor of the big and the small. The first time the atlas was used for geography was a reversal of the metaphor of atlas. And here you see atlas holding the cosmos and being much bigger because he uses, he uses geometry and mathematics in order to hold it. But of course, the thing has changed again. And now we are back in a situation when the globe is now much bigger than we are. So we have come full circles to the atlas uh, metaphor again. This is an interesting image. If you have other images, uh, please send them to me because I'm trying to collect all this trend. This is a very interesting mixture of Christ, sort of Christic figures, and the atlas uh, myth. So the most interesting things I'm trying to go through um, is this reversion of a notion of limits. Because when I was born, uh, we have decided that we were in an infinite space which is what there was no limit, and that when you, you could actually go as far as you wanted from here, the Earth, 
to the Big Bang, basically. There was this difference that historian of science called infralunar, be beneath the, the moon, and supralunar, above the moon, as unified. And the very puzzling feature of the situation where we are now is that we are back to this idea that there is a difference between the supralunar and the infralunar, because we will not actually move out. There is no out to move to. And this is this very strand, which is, of course, what Sloterdijk is trying to understand with this notion of sphere, a very, very different feeling where the notion of progress, the notion of indefinite progression and so on, becomes sort of moot, without being replaced by another positive myth about innovation and uh, continuation of the effort. And so there is this strange uh, disconnect again, this time between the metaphor of infinity and the notion of uh, cosmos. The cosmos suddenly feel very much like in Beckett day. This is why I use the same, I'm so, sorry to have used the, an Irish uh, authors, uh, waiting for Gaia is actually, of course, feeling, trying to make a connection between your great uh, artist. So we are back in many ways where we always were, of course, this is an amazing case which has been studied by Simon Schaffer, the great historian of science, where the cosmos has always been associated with politics, of course. This is Louis XIV, immediately as the Copernican revolution was uh, uh, absorbed by the culture, immediately it was used for, as a political emblem where for the king, the sun king. So it's not new that we do politics for the cosmos. What is new is the way we do it and the scale at which we do it. And the unability, this is your great Newton. And I want to test it a little bit around this notion very briefly for, before the discussion with another great thinker or scientist or popular, uh, popularizer of science, I don't know, it's hard to... James Lovelock, who is actually the inventor of a Gaia hypothesis. Gaia is a whole set of things from a new age <laughs> sort of myth to a scientific hypothesis, especially with Lynn Margulis, one of the co-authors of uh, James Lovelock, uh, and everything in between. But just to show you something, I want maybe everyone here knows so the idea James of the, Lovelock. Uh, and, uh, of the world that regulates itself. This is Lo James Lovelock was a journalist. One thing, but now we're at this point, and one thing we had talked about is you say it's too late. Like this is, we just need to deal with the inevitability. Just for people who perhaps haven't wrapped their head around it, what is your theory that says we're done? It's not so much a theory, it's coming from observations of what's happening around the Earth. And it's always important, observations are much more important than theories. Mm -hmm. We have plenty of theories. Now, uh, the Earth's been looking after itself for quite a while in the, what's called the interglacial, the kind of warm period we're in at the moment. But in the last few years, it started warming up. And this is a sign that it's moving away from the current state it's in to, it exists in stable states, either cold, middling or very hot, and it looks as if it's going to the very hot period. And it's been there many times before. Mm -hmm. And so, how long does it take to get to the place where we can no longer... Like, are you saying that... No, you're not saying the entire human race will be wiped out, but you're saying Heavens, that... Heavens, no, no. But a significant number. You're not talking about a party here. I, I'm afraid so. As, as many as seven out of eight are, are likely to be wiped out, yes. So, you see, it's not extremely funny. This is James Lovelock, seven out of eight, I'm told. This is what the famine did here in Ireland in the 19th century, which is about the same degrowth. So there are lots of people who are for decroissance, you see. Le Job James Lovelock is for decroissance at a sort of uh, extreme ways of decroissance, which is seven billions of us should disappear, and, but he doesn't say how we, we will manage that. So, see, this is, this is the strength. This is the guy on television very quietly explaining that seven out of eight of the human race has to disappear for Gaia to get into another, uh, before Gaia gets to another steady state. And the book is called The Revenge of Gaia. Now this could frighten you <coughs> somewhat, but what is interesting in, in Lovelock's is actually the issues of metaphor, because he's very, in, even though he's not a, a philosopher of any sort, he's very, in, very precise on the way he uses the metaphor. Metaphor is important because to deal with, understand, and even ameliorate the fix we are now in of a global change requires us to know the true nature of the Earth and imagine it as the largest living thing in the solar system, not something inanimate, 
like that disreputable contraption, spaceship Earth. And here there's a very interesting shift between the metaphor of spaceship Earth, which is, which is a machine, basically, and which is entirely mastery, mastered by each detail. And if you don't master each detail of a spaceship Earth, you are, you're, you're gone. And that's a metaphor that he opposes. <clears throat> so Gaia is not a machine. Gaia is a living organism. Unless we see the Earth as a planet that behaves as if it were alive, as if it's important, at least to the extent of regulating its climate and chemistry, we will lack the will to change our way of life and to understand that we have made it our greatest enemy. So all of these words are interesting here. I mean, if you think of a quote that was given to me this morning about Rick Santorum accusing Obama to prefer the Earth, you see that it's a strange... I mean, Santorum might be right, it's a strange mythology but it's not an easy way out because we are inside this Gaia system. We are just one of a feedback mechanism, except this feedback is only positive without negative feedback. And what, is, what Lovelock tries to, to push is that the use of a metaphor is necessary to have the will. So it's, a, it's a, another of these many, many, many connections between science and politics, which I'm interested in, and of course the word enemy which establish a very, very strange type of war. What it is to be at war with Gaia is, of course, complicated things. I mean, I just put some of, very, some of the elements of Gaia in this list. Gaia is, is indifferent to us, but it's very different from the indifference of nature of a romantic period, for instance. I mean, it's not that nature is indifferent. It's actually very sensitive to our own action. So it's a very strand of indifference. It's very difficult to map Gaia onto the former definition of nature, which had been developed by poets and scientists in the 19th and 20th uh, century. The second difficulty is, of course, that the humans is not a unified actor. There is no way to unify those who have very different responsibility anyway in this situation, if the situation exists as the climat climatologists say. Then we have this very strange Mebius strip about Gaia, where we are simultaneously inside it or her, and she is also part of us. So there is a very strange connection where it's very difficult to know who is doing what and who is mastering uh, what. There is no diplomacy. I mean, it's very difficult to be to imagine a diplomacy with Gaia, which is still at war with us. So it's, it's a very as asymmetric war. As Lovelock says, if we win, we lose, and if we lose, we lose too. So it's, it's not a funny situation. The situation with Gaia is a very... And, and yet, the war is also a metaphor. And of course, there are huge uncertainties, because there is nothing that assembles Gaia. And Gaia is a purely scientific set, I mean, concept of set of... Uh, of loops, of cybernetic loops. There is, nothing, there is no sort of big being behind all of this uh, thing. So it's very difficult to represent. Who are the representative of Gaia? I mean, how do you represent? What is the collective? What is the art? What is the politics? What is the science able to represent Gaia and to give it shape? And that's where, uh, of course, uh, where we are all <laughs> sort of lost. Because if we are in, if, if nature has become Gaia, so this supra infralunar, it's not the whole of nature, it's a very local, fragile envelope in which we are embedded, which is taking revenge for things none of us has done. I mean, I'm not responsible for climate change. You, none of you is responsible. We are responsible en masse. We are responsible, but who, what, it is, what does it mean to be responsible en masse? I mean, it's, and also the, the Irish might be less responsible than the American, or certainly uh, the Indians are less responsible, and the African even less. So, I mean, this is a completely bizarre political uh, agency we're supposed to be, the humans confronting Gaia with taking revenge of, of her. So this is where <laughs> we have some trouble. Where is the technology of representation, which is at the right scale? I mean, this is what... Especially if you take now, in, and that's where reenacting takes another meaning of the word, which is the machine itself. This is a, a, I don't know if you know the book, which is a marvelous book, best probably produced, uh, on the computer's uh, modeling and the climate, uh, the history of climate, climatology, which is uh, by, done by a guy 
called uh, Paul Edwards, who is a great science student and historian of science. And the, the machinery itself, the foregrounding of the machinery necessary to produce the climatology inside which is produced all this knowledge which is used in this political situation is itself a very, very important uh, step in understanding the representative government. Uh, in other words, the scientists of climatology are the one producing a large part of the representation of what it is to be on Earth. So is it because they are scientists? Yes, of course, they are scientists. But it's also because they represent the place where we actually reside. And that's where the foregrounding of all the institution, technology, computer science, modeling, uh, and the dispute, of course, and the controversies necessary to represent should be foregrounded. This is a beautiful <laughs> uh, mock-up uh, by an artist, a French artist of one of the few, one of the first, actually, computer, at the time when the word computer meant humans and not machine, in order to calculate meteorology at the time, in the 1930s. So all of this progressive knowledge of the situation in which we reside is actually part of what we mean by reenacting science. So the big question now for discussion, and I think I'm, I've kept exactly the 25 minutes you asked me, is uh, can, what it, does it mean to take the word on our shoulders? I mean, no one of us would want to have a word on our shoulders. We were perfectly happy with the situation before, where the nature was the framework, the background inside which we were actually staging our own uh, most of the time, a horrifying human history of famines, death, death, wars, and misery. But at least nature was out of that. And it's, now we have all the misery, all of the misery of human fights, but in addition, we have to take care of everything else, which is inside this sort of uh, Gaia uh, myth. And we are not prepared for that. There is nothing that prepares for taking actually on our back the uh, that amount of representative government. It is no, this is not what we meant by representative government. We were, when we invented representative government, we, are, we were thinking of taxation. We were not thinking of a climate. We are not thinking of fish. We are not thinking of potatoes. So all of these things were not supposed to be part. They were sort of sent to the technicians, and now they are the most important element, which even now impinged onto the American election, which is something so surprising, really. So I'll finish on this very strange image, which I've found no other one. So if anyone in art historian here has another one, I'd be delighted to know. This is, of course, one of the many myths about having the Earth on our shoulder is St. Christopher. Uh, not St. Patrick, I'm sorry. St. Christopher, which is, as you know, the name itself says... Weighing, weighing the Christ on his shoulder. Christ is a small child, and asking Christopher, who is a, huh, what's the name in English, a guy who crosses, who helped crossing rivers? What's the word of the song? What's the word for someone who crosses the channel? It must be. Well, anyway, he's the guy who is there, and very, he's a giant, and a little kid is on his shoulder, and and he says, the kids ask Christopher, can you carry me on the other side of the river? And Christopher says, yes, it's a very light weight. And while he's on in the middle of the river, the weight of the little Christ infant increases and Christopher has water until then and says, I'm going to die, I'm going to die. And then he realized that it's Christ who had it, he had on his shoulder and helped him cross again the ford. And that's why he is on his uh, stick. But what is very original in this image, and I found no other examples, is that Christ here, the Jesus on the top of it, is actually inside a representation of a cosmos, of a sphere of a cosmos. This is not the Earth, it's the whole cosmos with the zodiac signs. So this is a... If we are trying to find mythology for uh, what does it mean to have a weight of a universe on our shoulder, this might be a more positivist, positive, sorry, certainly not positivist, positive view uh, than Clive Hamilton uh, celebrating the end of our species or James Lovelock 
trying to imagine how we can uh, wipe out seven out of eight of us, which is about this part here, all the others disappearing. And it seems that it's the duty of artists, philosophers, and political scientists, scientists to try to avoid the dramatic consequence of this position. But I, I'm not a catastrophist. I'm from Bonn in Burgundy. You know, no, no catastrophist exists there. Uh, this is not the place. Uh, and I'm from a wine family. So, I mean, it's not the sort of thing where you grow catastrophes. What is in, interests me is the disconnect. The disconnect between the size of the scale, in the, the sort of extent of a dispute which are going on in the scientific literature as well as in the public domain, as the American campaign shows. And our own art, our own set of feelings, our set of aesthetics, in the original sense of aesthetics, that is what is, allows us to feel. There is no feel, we don't have a feel. The best feel we have is actually coming from climatology itself. But for that, you have to foreground the science. And it's, of, of course, why this is a good topic for a, a gallery like the one we are here. And that's why I'm very pleased to be a Leonardo member, although I'm not sure this little medal gives the mind and brain of Leonardo da Vinci himself automatically. But I'm very pleased to be with you tonight. And now we can start the discussion. Thank you very much. Right in time. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, we want to have uh, a little bit of time for some uh, discussion with the audience. Um, uh, so I hope you'll all uh, come up with some great questions. Uh, I just want to maybe uh, kick off with uh, a question, Bruno. You, you talked a lot about uh, planetary governance and, and the need for uh, uh, this, uh, a new form of uh, planetary politics. Um, you also showed uh, a lot of images uh, from uh, art history, uh, images of the Atlas myth and so on. Um, one question I had was, you know, do you see a role for contemporary artists in uh, dealing with questions uh, on, uh, of such a massive scale as uh, the, the climate issue? Um, how, how could that work or what role could there be for artists in this? Oh, I think the artists are everywhere on that. If you see Melancholia by Lars van Trier, yeah. the whole thing is about a massive planet coming in and smashing the planet. And the artist is actually itself, yeah. himself, building this little uh, tent inside which the kid magically is supposed to be immunized against the fear yeah. of a catastrophe. The catastrophe is there. And, and, and there is a great uh, German... Uh, a stage manager called uh, Mark Thaler, who, who did an amazing play uh, on, on the Inuit uh, in the same spirit and the horse of Turin. Uh, and horse of Turin. That was Lars von Trier. <laughs> Influencing actually, the planet. Mark Thaler, actually, the <laughs> Gaia in Mark Thaler play does that, about that sort of noise, actually. <laughs> For a loudspeaker, which is somewhere there. So I think there are uh, lots of artists, and actually we, we are doing a festival on, on, on all of these arts, because all of the artists, I mean, this is precisely why it cannot be done without the artists, because the, 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 at every time there is such a disconnect of feeling and catching and, and prise and, and sort of hold, hand, handle. Yes. Um, and of course there is the, the main handle so far we have are the sciences themselves, which is why it's so interesting. For once there is a complete collaboration between the sciences and the, not because their sciences are on the side of knowledge. It's not that they are not about knowledge. It's about the fact that they have, they have the instruments to deal with the scale of a, of a phenomenon. Actually, they have the instrument to produce the notion of scale itself. And that's why, again, Slotadek, a series of study about the, the globe as, a, as, an, as an image, the globe as a, as a, as a metaphor is so important. No, it's, it's, it's interesting because uh, ever since we opened the Science Gallery four years ago, people have kept saying, well, you should do an exhibition about climate change. You know, you really must do an exhibition about climate change. And we've kept, always said, oh, we'll do that next year. You know, uh, but, um, not because we don't think it's a critical, important subject, but because it just seems so difficult to... Uh, to connect with, to, to, to connect people with. And um, so we, we've ended up sort of, you know, doing shows that maybe touch on certain aspects, like outside we have the Edible show, which touches on eating in the Anthropocene and, and uh, which, you know, the effects of eating on the environment and so on. But 
we, we really struggle with how, how you might do something about uh, uh, climate change in a context like the gallery. Have you any suggestions? Well, the London Science Museum is a nice one, actually. Really? We have a nice, uh, yeah. Mm. But of course, it, it's impossible to tackle it heads on. I mean, you have to find, uh, I mean, I'm sure you, you, you do a splendid show here, so you will find a way to take mm. it sort of laterally. Yeah. And of course, one, one of the very interesting things for me, but it might be difficult to put in a show, is the, which is very well uh, studied by Paul Edwards, is the complete misunderstanding in the epistemology of climate change science as a science. Yeah. I mean, because it doesn't re resemble any of the other science. It's a yeah. historical science. It's yes. a science which is based on precedent. Mm. It's a science which is based on models. It's a, it's a, it's a science where every data is entirely recalculated through for, for, for the mothers themselves. Mm. So it seems as if, and that's why the climate deniers are so incensed, mm. because it doesn't look like the epistemology. Well, so the, 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 the proof, the, the, the production uh, of the proof itself is different. And that's, uh, I don't know how you can make well, it. I, I think, yeah, there, there may be a deeper problem that, uh, you know, we love putting contro controversy on display, but even that act itself is very problematic in the case of climate change, right? And even yesterday, there was the uh, the Heartland Institute uh, allegedly, you know, these documents were were leaked, which uh, uh, supposedly showed that you know there was millions of dollars, uh, part, and much of it was invested in actually uh, getting scientists to to uh, attack climate blogs and to having legal attacks on climate blogs. So the putting the controversy at centre stage is, is as a as a gesture in engaging climate change is actually seems to be a very problematic thing to do. If and, if it's a controversy with two sides, mm. because that, of course, would be counterproductive, because there's actually not two sides, but the other side has been made up entirely. This is a, this is a spurious controversy, yes. which in itself is very interesting to show. What do yes. you do with spurious controversies? Yes. But it's conspiracy theory, yeah. and, and, and in, in, the, in this case, what is so, there's a whole literature, uh, quite excellent, actually, on this, I mean, art, the, the Heartland Institute is just one little mm -hmm. bit. But there is excellent uh, study on how the, the, I mean, the controversy was actually produced artificially, mm. from Mr. Lunch all the way to yeah. now. So, it, the, of course, what would be very clever is to do a controversy. Uh, uh, I mean, I, I've kept mapping controversy for 15 years, so I'm very interested in this one, yeah. which is precisely to show that there is no symmetry yes. between the climatologists and the others, and yet to, to try to, to open up uh, how, how do we as, as citizens do when we are faced with the, the claim that every time there is a climato climatologist, you, su you should have also a climate denier? Because mm. if you accepted that, then you accept the climate deniers win. Mm. Because of course, but that's a very interesting political issue in itself, which means that we suppose that the action depends entirely on the certainty of the sciences, which is not the way action, political action is produced. It, doesn't re doesn't, it needs science, but it not, does not rely on it. But so I, there are all yeah. sorts of issues which would be very interesting to bring to the attention of your gallery. But how do you feel about the way your work, for example, has been sometimes referenced, or the work of uh, other people uh, like David Bloor and so on, the social constructionist has been uh, sometimes used actually far uh, uh, propounding of the sort of contrarian science or the sort of uh, what some people call the Republican war of science. They, they've, you know, how, how do you feel about that? Uh, well, they use whatever weapons they have and that's fair game. I mean, they can use whatever, but uh, they will not win at that one because if you foreground the practice of science, it's not the climate deniers that win. Because, in fact, very little of them are scientists in the domain. Mm. So my argument is say, you want to use our tools? Well, go all the way. Use our tools. And then let's map out the differences. Yes. And the differences is that if you foreground the institution of science, the production of science, the, the practice of science, then the interesting question is, okay, what, what, are, what sort of science do you produce? Yes. And uh, immediately, see, the, 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 they hide behind the science with a big S, Yes. And they say, you are not, they say to the climatologist, you are not real scientists because you agree, which is a very strange, actually, definition of it. Mm. You have too much agreement in your discipline. Yes. And that's fishy. There's something wrong in, yeah. being, in being <laughs> agreeing so it. Yeah. Because in science, so they use a very uh, sort of um, very naive idea of what uh, science is about. And Galileo is always coming, not Leonardo, but Galileo is coming in very, very quickly. I mean, one, one man can be right when all the others are wrong. So we have a minister in France who is a former minister, 
Claude Allegra, who has never done one single paper on climatology, but who has been immensely uh, successful in climate skeptics. Mm. I think I would almost call climate negationist, really, uh, without having uh, produced one single paper in the domain. I, 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 not out of interest, yeah. not out of, I mean, of lobbying interest, out of, on, out of, on, out of contrarian, precisely. Mm. But I don't think he is using my stuff. I'm mm. pretty sure of it. But it, it, it seems, I mean, obviously the, the, the question of planetary governance is a really big one to grasp, but even the question of the governance of science, um, I mean, the, the Heartland Institute is one example uh, of, you know, these really well-funded organizations that are actually generating their own R&D, uh, which also happens for the, uh, the creationists, for example. Uh, there's, so, it, and it, it seems that we're living in an interesting moment for the governance of science. Uh, we have, you know, two, last week we uh, told the Elsevier controversy about, uh, you know, the huge amounts of money that uh, they're making from publishing academic papers and the, the open science movement is uh, really taking off and uh, has been embraced now by the Wellcome Trust. And um, there is the, I suppose, you know, even here in Dublin, we had a, uh, uh, somebody who discovered an asteroid in Rahini in the north side of Dublin, you know, from the back garden. Uh, so there's, a, there, there's a, a sort of a blossoming of citizen science movements. Um, do, you, do you have thoughts on how, you, you know, you might approach the question of, you know, the governance, how science should be governed? Science should not be governed. Okay. <laughs> no, I think it's just a phenomenon that science and technology are coextensive to the social fabric. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now forget about domains. I mean, no, it's no longer the case. It's about cosmology. So the question now is, is about okay, we we are engaged in the cos cosmopolitics, and uh, we compare cosmopolitics with one another. Yeah. I mean, that's. I mean, there's, there's no government of that. There's no way to vet yeah. some people as not being scientists. There is conspiracy theorists everywhere. So if you do the smallest amount of authoritative treatment, immediately you have dozens of conspiracists or mm. anti-conspiracists mm. who say this is, this is uh, fishy and there is something wrong with that. Mm. So it seems to me that the only way to regain a sense of authority is precisely to do what, I mean, the sort of thing we, we try to do is mapping controversy, that is to foreground the practice of, of, the practice of science on one and uh, this cosmopolitic, which is that we, we now, it's not that it's about science, it's about the world we live in. Now, with what do we want to live in? With what entities we want to live in? And can we have the tools? We, and that's again why artists, uh, scientists, and politics, political uh, people are very important to work together because we have to represent this cosmopolitic fight. This is where the dividing line is. It's not between science and the public. It's inside public, in many, many different cosmological association between entities which have to be compared. And so it, it requires a very, very different way of drawing and representing the political arena. This is what we try in making things public, but it was just an experiment. Now we have to do it for, for good, so to speak. And that's why things like this science gallery are so important and many other sites. This is why all the things which were done before in the universities are now done in science museums and all over the place, because that's where things happen. Nothing happens in universities anymore, but outside of them, in all of these places, uh, the classical poem, which date from Humboldt, I mean, the image I started with, really, representing again what it is to be associated with, that's what the things are. I mean, is it science, is it politics, is it art? I mean, it's different skills, obviously, but it's not different domains. The task is the same. It seems to me. And it Maybe just one more question before I open it up to the audience. Um, so, you know, a lot of your early work uh, was on, you know, actor network theory and uh, then the, the ideas about actants and so on. And, um, you know, that was pre-internet. Pre uh, and, uh, um, you know, now we have the social media, we have the internet of things, uh, and, um, you know, we have... Uh, a moment where you have people like uh, Clay Shirky writing uh, Here Comes Everybody and talking about how the, the age of the institution is over. And uh, um, I, I'm curious to know how um, these changes have changed your own thinking about the, the organization of knowledge. My own thinking of no, is of no interest about that. The question is what happened to the organization of knowledge itself? That's what you mean. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm not sure because 
I mean, obviously you know, it produced a lot of new data, which is very good to follow actor network, but mm. we were there before with actor network. I mean, mm. this is, I mean <laughs> we just now have the data, yeah. which is what is great, the data about this, all this connection. But now the, dis the dissolving of institution, I don't believe at a minute, yes. because precisely the question is on the contrary, to redo boundaries, to redo enclosure, to redo uh, quiet space for thinking, to redo institution in other words. That's again the interest tension between actor network and Peter Sotadek spheres uh, argument, because uh, that's where a lot of interesting images and sort of aesthetics is being uh, produced for many different artists. Uh, one of I like is Thomas Saracino, because of the way he imagined uh, bubbles and networks simultaneously. Uh, so everybody is trying to think about networks nowadays. We were there before. Yeah. But the problem is that networks don't dissolve boundaries. And on the contrary, the reinvention of bounded space, and I mean, this is true, of course, for nations and for Europe also, uh, becomes a crucial thing. And of course, for Gaia as well. So Gaia is one envelope, one little tiny envelope. And, and the question of enclosure, um, and the inside, outside, which is, after, after all, the classical question of politics, we begins, I mean, begins to be, again, very important. So I don't believe at all the sort of dissolving uh, uh, which is which is one of the effects of the of the internet. Okay. And I'm actually going to sneak in one final final question uh, before I pass the audience. Um, you uh, you mentioned the play uh, Waiting for Gaia. I mean, I'm just really fascinated to know a little bit more about your experience of uh, you know writing a play and uh, how, how that was for you and. Uh, what well, I'm a terrible playwright. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's no problem. Uh, no, I mean, I'm just doing it with other people who are, who are themselves playwriters. I mean, I'm just feeding uh, ideas coming from this sort of thing, and images, and, 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 I, and then I write down what they say, yeah. and what actors themselves, I mean, actors themselves yeah. uh, improvise. Yeah. So, uh, écriture de plateau, it's called in French, I don't know how you say it in English. So, uh, this, is, this is a collective work, I'm just the scribe. You know, is, it, is it more like a philosophical dialogue, or, or is it a No, no, proper, it's a real play, know? it's funny, oh, it's a tragedy. It's, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> it's a comical yeah. tragedy, and of course, Claude Allegro plays yes. a big role in it, but so is Clive Hamilton, and Excellent. Noah, of course, is in it as well. Great. Frankenstein, I mean, a lot, lot of people. <laughs> Sounds brilliant, well, I'm, I'm, we'd love to have it in Dublin sometime. Uh, uh, so uh, now I'd love to uh, pass it over to um, questions from the audience. Do we have any questions? So one right there in the front row. There are actually microphones, if you wouldn't mind just waiting uh, for a microphone to reach you. Yeah, thank you. And maybe you just, uh, if you want, you can say your name before you ask your question. Oh, hi, uh, Marcus from Trinity College. Uh, in uh, Laboratory Life, uh, you mentioned, uh, you talk about the, sci the construction of scientific statements, so going from, you know, purely speculative to, towards something that is generally accepted by you know, the scientific uh, community. So uh, in the case of the climate change, uh, is there a, a sort of a deadlock where we, we're still in this kind of speculative arena? And is there a way of uh, overcoming that? And is, would that be uh, would the issue be specifically political? My impression reading, uh, again, the literature and using the tools for controversy mapping is that the controversies about it is zero. Uh, inside, of course, there are lots of controversies about glaciers, I mean, in micro controversies, but the anthropogenic origin of climate change uh, seems to be an established fact. Now, of course, um, there are lots of problems with this statement because uh, the question is uh, what the epistemology of this established fact is very different from lots of other ways of producing science. Every science, every discipline has its own epistemology, its own way of producing proof. And here, certainly one of the things that happened in the climate gate, I mean, you remember when, two years ago when the climate gate was, was, was showed, people were very surprised that, that scientists exchanged emails. <laughs> scientists exchanging emails? What is very strange, I mean, and looking for money and massaging the data, they're not supposed to do that. Science is supposed to, I mean, nature is supposed to speak by herself without any mediation. So when you have this idea of science, every single activity by the scientist looks suspicious. And that's why this guy I showed the third slide is actually very funny, because they find very small differences 
into the way the, the, the thermometers in one station is, is, is calibrated without realizing that all of that is completely redone and recalculated by the models. And they say this is, this is fishy because you are based the model on data and the data on the model, this is a circular argument. It's actually a very strong argument. So the strength of all these sciences, which is demonstrated very nicely in uh, Paul Edo's book, is actually very strong. But it's a historical science. It's a science based on precedent. And at the end of his book, Edward made actually the amazing point that we will never know better now because we influence the situation so much that the, the series of preliminary cases on which we build the statistic will be itself modified. This is actually a big problem for insurance company because insurance company cannot calculate it the next step because the, the numbers of elements we had before is so out of whack that they cannot make their historical calculation and have a medium. So uh, is it political? Now, my solution to that problem, I know it's a very complicated, I mean, very provocative way to say it, is stop saying the difference. We will solve this question by maintaining the distinction between science and politics. Tell explicitly what your politics is. You, I mean, when Rick Perry, the governor of Texas, accused the scientists in climatology to do that for money, I want the scientists to say, okay, let's put the money on the table. How much do we earn? How much money do we get from the grant? How much do you get for the grant? Who is paying you, like the Artland Institute? So instead of, 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 of defending science by the Maginot line, I mean, this might be a metaphor for French, not for the Irish. What, did you have an equivalent of Maginot line here? Um, the pale. The pale, uh, the pale, beyond the pale, okay. <laughs> See, they use the machinal line and say, let's not do any politics, we just do science. And then they, whoosh, they are, every time they are run, run out because they cannot defend. This is not the argument. The argument is to say, let, okay, if you want to do politics, let's do politics. Let's fly under our own colors. And then we'll see who is the lobbyist, who is paid, what we want, what's the cosmology we want. You, the Rick Perry cosmology is not the same as uh, Hansen's cosmology. So cosmology against cosmology seems to me a much more fecund and honest way of fighting this battle than to say, okay, let's not mix science and politics at all. Let's have a science completely immune from politics because that will never work because now the one who accuses, who uses this argument are actually the climate denier. We say we are just speaking in the name of science and science should be value-free and apolitical. So now... <laughs> Now it's the climatologists to actually come, to, this is an answer to your first question, which come to me, people like me, and say, would you help us? Because we are attacked by these big guys, these very, very nasty guys who are using epistemology to attack us. This is unfair, and they are in tears. <laughs> I know a guy who was in tears. I mean, he got a depression after Copenhagen 2009 because he was accused by Allegre of being a lobbyist, a bad scientist. And they actually claim, this is very funny, I don't know what happened here, but they actually <laughs> sort of went to the minister and said, well, you should organize, you should defend, minister, Mrs. she was a woman, uh, would you defend us against this unfair attack from the climate deniers? So you see, everything of the old divide between science and politics is moot. More questions? Yeah, this one back there. Um, hi, my name is Kurt O'Neill. I'm a past student at Trinity College, and thank you very much for talking this evening. I'm just, um, I'm not entirely <laughs> convinced by the role of art with, um, with climate change and the pressure that it could be could, could exert on, on the public as such. You know, um, in my opinion, now, art kind of doesn't reach the mass public who may be involved in making change. We talked about climate change and being responsible for everyone, the mass. Um, but a lot of the pictures that you actually showed this evening were quite pressurizing, they were worrying, you know, you, when you looked at an image as such, you kind of felt a bit overwhelmed, kind of, um, you know, it's, how, do you, how do you actually achieve that? By the, who would want to take that kind of pressure in their hands? Who'd, uh, it seemed quite hopelessness in a way, you know? And if art is to get involved in such a dramatic way, I think, you know, and take on similar images as such, you might feel a bit hopelessness about the cause instead of feeling hope about the cause. I think, you know, there may change, may can, can happen as such. And, uh, 
you know, you're, you're not overwhelmed by looking at such an image. So it's, although it, you know, it can play a certain role, it has to be the right form of art and not to, the hopelessness of art, you know, to kind of, climate change is happening, it's a lot of pressure, who wants to take that pressure? Does the mass want to take it? Well, they may not be educated enough to understand it, let alone understand the image of what's going on, you know? Yeah, that's very interesting. The, the problem, there might be a problem with dramatization, actually, which is, of course, a problem when you do a drama, because dramatization might not be the best way to handle that. Now, I'm not sure I understand what you say about art, because if you take, for uh, example, which, which is also, I take art very broadly. So for me, for example, uh, Avatar was, was, a, was a Gaia play, a Gaia film, uh, because it dealt with this very original argument that we, uh, Pandora, which is actually my, my planet, uh, my own, I did a book called Pandora's Hope, so I sort of thought that Avatar was a sort of spin-off from my book, but... <laughs> I didn't get any royalty for it. Uh, and he got a lot of money out of it, actually. But uh, I, I, for me, it's the same sort of artistic, uh, and that was very popular, I think, was from, from Pandora, the, the white um, mercenaries actually withdraw. So you have to take art in a very, very large sense. Uh, Lars Van Trier is, is a very powerful uh, movie. So, but I agree with you, it's not only art. One of the other entry, of course, into the passion that art, the scale of the phenomena, is religion. And it's, again, I'm interested also in Gaia. I had no time to mention that except at the very end. Because of a religious connection, uh, the, the sort of passion, if, we, if, if, it, if the goal is to bring, the, if I understood your question, the passion at the level which are necessary at, for the scale of the phenomenon, if I understood your question, uh, certainly religion would be another candidate. Now, here the situation is extremely tense, and, and St. Rome, again, is a good example, because uh, the Orthodox, in, in, in Christianity, the Orthodox are the more advanced in ecological uh, rituals. Uh, but, of course, there is a big, big, big question of if we insist on ecological rituals, how pagan is it? And that's actually what is the phony theology St. Rome accused Obama of believing in it. This is exactly the point, if I read the interview. Thank you very much, by the way, for giving me this. I re read it uh, in the New York Times since then. And, and it's exactly, exactly the point, which is, if you insist on doing something for the earth, then you are a pagan. Now, in a very, very strange definition of Catholicity, where to be Christian means to be out of, yeah, to go to another world. But there is another string of Catholicity uh, a little less in Protestantism, a lot in, in Orthodoxy, which is to say, no, ecology is the reinvention of incarnation. So there's a whole series of spiritual ecology, which I'm very interested in, which rephrase the question of the earth as incarnation. We are now not looking up, we are looking down. And they, they, I, I've, I've written a piece on that, which is, quite interesting to discuss with, with priests, and I, 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 dis, I discussed that with the Cardinal of Venice, who happens to be a very enlightened person. There is this saying in the Bible, in the Gospel, that says, uh, what, I'm not sure of a translation in English, what, what, what's the use of saving the earth if you forfeit your soul? And of course, now there are people who say this is the opposite. I mean, what, what's the use of uh, saving your soul if you forfeit for faith, the earth. Because after all, if there is no earth, there is no Christianity either. So Gaia, the conflict between Gaia and the Christian God is extremely interesting. And that has the energy which is necessary. Of course, it's touching religious energy is always dangerous, as you know, in this country as well as in mine. So it's a bit tricky, uh, but it's quite interesting. So art, religion, anthropology, political science, economy. Economy is a very important thing. All of the disciplines are touched by this question of ecology. That's why it's so interesting. You know, it's uh, interesting in light of what you just said, that the center of the medieval cosmos wasn't really Earth. It was hell. It was an in inferno-centric cosmos. Uh, right. I mean, actually, Schroederdeck has, has 140 pages in Sphere 2 about this question. Because oh. there is a disconnect in the metaphor. Is God of the middle yeah. or is it the, uh, the hell? Mm -hmm. And what happened when you get into the Copernican Revolution? Mm -hmm. 
uh, and where do you put God, and where do you put the earth, and where do you put the sun? So all these questions are back in. I mean, we are completely back in this question of pre-17th century, and that's why everything is so exciting, because all the metaphors of nature, all the metaphors of cultures are being modified. Uh, one over here, and yeah, no, just here, sorry. sorry. And then here, sorry. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the question of time. I'm thinking that the sublunar is the temporal, but all the metaphors that you've just addressed there, they're, they're metaphors of structure, system, spatial relation, what's at the center, what's that. But I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the, the question of, say, uh, um, the temp temporalities of the cosmopolitics that you envisage. I, I'm thinking of things like transgenerational thinking, or, you know, mm -hmm. how does the question of time play within your thinking? That's very interesting. I, I have to move for that. I, I wrote, I mean, I have, to, I have to act, I'm afraid, here. Um, I've, I've written a paper on compositionism around this, because the point is that my idea is that we, are, we, were, f we, we were having a future. In French, it works better, because in French, we say future et avenir. We have two words. So future, we had a future. And we suddenly turn around and see things coming at us. So the, the, the dancing movement I should do, I won't be ridiculous enough to do it, <laughs> is we had a future of fleeing backwards something horrifying and looking like this, but not too much, right? <laughs> so this is what we had as a future. And now we turn around, and here we are horrified. So it's a very strange, the timing, you're perfectly right, I use here mostly spatial metaphor, but the timing, the, the change in the time is even more interesting. Because the way we had, when we had a future, was a future turned actually by horror of the past. And actually there is a very important book um, by Tulmin, Stephen Tulmin, working on that metaphors of a, of a, of a, of a, of a fleeing time. What, his idea is that what happened in the 17th century it was they fled the religious wars. I mean, this is the whole, what he called counter-scientific revolution, is about fleeing the religious war. So it was a future entirely made around the question of never again will we go to the religious war. So it was a future based on the flight away from the horror, which of course, like in Benjamin Andrew's story, created a lot of destruction behind us, which we sort of ignore. And suddenly we turn, and the destruction are now back in. And this is visible in many thinkers. Uh, Ulrich Beck, of course, the whole sociology of Beck is around this change of, of, of time. So you're perfectly right. It's even more interesting for time as it is for, 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 for space, which is the whole question of progress, the whole question of avenir, what is coming to us. And again, Gaia is interesting because where, where is it in time? Gaia was there. What's the position of Gaia in time is even as more interesting as it is on, uh, on space. You're perfectly right. Thank you for asking the, the question. Thank you. We just have time for a couple more questions. Uh, one here, and then one here, and then one here. So, Grace, Grace, yes. Sorry, Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, I was interested in the way that you were sort of saying human influence now is comparable to tectonic plate shifts and we can compare to these geomorphic kind of framings. And the largest organizations that we have that kind of move at that pace are multinational companies. And I was just wondering in relation to the question of whose shoulders this is all sort of standing on, what role you see multinational companies playing within this relationship with Gaia in particular, <coughs> given that they're um, so tied into our cycles of consumption and production? Well, they are tiny compared to the masses. Uh, the argument about the Anthropocene is actually coming from a book by a student of Simon Schaffer, who is the economist, uh, scientist, writer, a remarkable book. Um, I'm sorry, his name escaped to me. He calculated in megajoule the weight of the humans compared to the, I mean, it's actually the geologist who did that. 
uh, in megajoule, the weight of the human plus the industry plus the agriculture. So it's widely larger than the multinational. And that's in terms of megajoule as the same energy per minute as, as the plate tectonic. I mean, it's at least comparable in numbers. I mean, of course, this calculation is a bit rough, but it, it's precisely this shift of scale. So your question is interesting because before we were thinking that the multinational were really the big entity, plus the army, plus the American army, plus, I mean, some, I mean, Soviet at the time and so on. Uh, but this is tiny compared to the Anthropos, which is supposed to be the Anthropocene. But of course, you're right. The multinational have a legal, a legal definition and effective power, while the Anthropos, which is supposed to be the political representative of that, has no has no existence. I mean, it has no, it's just it sort of dotted line. Uh, and that's, a, of course, the, the big economic as well as political crime. But the one represented at the, at the right scale don't exist. And may, maybe the, this is, of course, the big crime. So every work, every work of representing again the multinational is actually very important. There are lots of artists actually doing this. And it, it's very important to, to scale to show the, the scale of this, but they are tiny compared to the Anthropos. The biggest entity, which is the Anthropos, has no legal uh, lineament. And that's why it's so amazing. And yet it has to do with politics. Was there one final question? Uh, yeah, in the middle up there. Yeah. There is actually, sorry to go on, but yeah. there's an amazing film, if you find that on, the, on, on YouTube, of Copenhagen 2009. It has been recently shown by the Spiegel someone actually shot the dispute, the discussion at the end between all the heads of state, Obama, Merkel, Sarkozy, the Chinese delegation, and it's an amazing thing. Because you, suddenly you have this complete disconnect between the size of a, of a, of a prime, which is a climate change, and, and the discussion in a very small, they're all crowded in a very small room, they have a translator, so they don't, it's very difficult to hear what they say, and they shout to one another in their different languages, trying to haggle about little things, and Sarkozy is treating the other guy, of, the Chinese guy, of hypocrite, and the, guy, the other guy is very furious about that. And it, it's an amazing piece of political uh, uh, ethnology. So the disconnect is what I'm interested in. Um, you speak of um, a, a war between humanity and Gaia. Um, what would you say to, to humans being actually an instrument of Gaia, and that the, this confrontation is, is in our perception rather than reality? Instrument in which sense? You mean delegated from Gaia to fight? Not so much delegated, uh, more so that we are a part of Gaia, that Gaia and we, we are a part of this system and mm -hmm. are, are fulfilling perhaps her, her mission, if you want to put it that way. <laughs> Uh, you mean the, the, the one-eighth of us left? I'm afraid so. We, <laughs> we, we are all going to end up in that place. And I think the important thing to, to remember is the journey we take. Um, uh -huh. We can't avoid this end. And I know, you know that's, that's very harsh, but um, I think it's how, how we travel is important. Yes, that's interesting. Uh, I mean, of course... In, in Lovelock's original argument, uh, Gaia will, will go on. I mean, there's no problem with Gaia. She, she will just, as you say, shake us off. She will, she, she will do this and will disappear. So she will just change the state and she has been there for long. So it's not a problem of Gaia. It, and he has this other amazing line where every, everything which is uh, be, be, below one kilo will resist pretty well. Everything above will have trouble. Uh, in, the, in the stage in which he sees Gaia going, which is uh, a, a, a 10 degree Earth, I mean, something really different from where we are, we are at. So, of course, we are part of it. Well, we are part of it, and of course, no. And that's, I mean, this is a central question, because what, what it is to be part of Gaia, it's a maybe a strip. So we are in it, but we also, she is us. And actually, your, your argument would be quite optimistic in a way, but if, if we are part of Gaia, we are no longer at war with her, so to speak. So she needs to do something for us, <laughs> because we are so much us, we, sorry, we are so much her, that if she gets rid of us, if, she, if we weigh so much, it would be 
against your interest? That's what you are e eating at? Ah, that's interesting. Let's try the diplomatic <laughs> enterprise with Gaia. <laughs> you should not get rid of us too fast because we are part of you. <laughs> and you're right, we have, we have made her interesting. So it's a sort of neo-Hegelian argument in a way that we, we humans have made Gaia more interesting. Uh, by science, by doing all sorts of experiments on her, so it would be a pity if she was getting rid of us. <laughs> That's another diplomatic uh, uh, untreatment, which is quite interesting. Uh, I, I think it's nicely ironic that uh, you've entitled your talk "Reenacting Science." Uh, it, so, uh, reenacting science, and this is like effectively an experiment that we only get to do once, uh, as we've just heard. Uh, <laughs> so not a lot of reenactment is going to be possible. Um, so I, I'm afraid that's all we have time for. Uh, and I'd just like to thank you all for your questions. And uh, again, thank the French Embassy for the support of this evening's event and of bringing Bruno Latour here. And just ask you to join me in thanking our newest honorary Leonardo, Bruno Latour. Yes, thank you. Much.